as a service, or essentially when people start talking about digital transformation or any of their coin marketing terms that are out there, essentially we're talking about moving our estates from legacy, we procure gear, right? We implement it and stand it up and build it towards the as a service model. So essentially traditional IT, right? We, and back in my day, right? I would go out, budget for everything, capitally acquire it, start depreciating it, getting it on the books. And then, um, you know, the industry is kind of transitioning towards that OPEX model towards utility or as a service. The benefits of that we're going to get into and the advantages we'll get into that. But essentially what we're moving though is, um, it's re referred to as a shared risk model, right? So you think about owning your own assets, your own infrastructure. The only people that are on the hook is there's an OEM warranty supplied with that. Maybe there's some software support that comes along the way when you build it yourself. But essentially, IT owns the whole risk paradigm. When we start considering the as-a-service model, you're shifting some of that risk towards um, the as-a-service model where the service provider will start taking ownership to a certain degree besides just maybe providing, as we talked about before, data centers and facility space, maybe power availability. Now we're talking about providing the actual infrastructure, maybe the platform or the full software as a service stack. So you will may have seen this slide in different iterations, but um, it'll be referred to later on in one of the other decks as well, maybe in a different color format. But this is the shared risk model uh, or shared destination model. Um, essentially from the left to the right, right, we're talking about uh, color code as user managed versus provider managed. And in the on-premises stack, which is legacy IT, where I run my own facilities, I buy my own gear, um, I could even lease my own gear, but at the same time, I still have full responsibility, full ownership, full control of that entire stack from a risk model standpoint. Uh, moving into the basics of as a service, uh, traditional IT has considered infrastructure as a service. So if you virtualize your data center, you know, a direct lift and shift of that is moving into infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service, essentially, the service provider, it's not really shown, right, because we're, we're talking about the facilities are kind of out of the equation. But the facilities also make up a piece of that equation because when I've looked at or I've assessed in my past infrastructure as a service providers, again, also looking from the ground up, if you're considering what's called enterprise cloud versus maybe EC2 from Amazon or Azure services, right, the facility actually may come into play where that infrastructure is actually being hosted. So one of the things I would talk about here in this shared risk, right, is we're talking about operational control of the, you know, the OSI stack, but the actual facilities could make a difference, you know, from a, an awareness perspective. So an infrastructure as a service, right, we are essentially taking care of the facilities, uh, the servers, um, so that's, that's going to be the hardware, any storage, and then your networking, and then the virtualization layer. So as a service provider, they're going to hand off at the virtualization layer to a customer so that you would instantiate your virtual workloads and then move up the stack from there. There are two types of infrastructure as a service when it comes to cloud models. There's private cloud where customers need to bring um, assets that need integration into the hypervisor or they own technology, maybe part of their equation. It could be their backups, it could be some security products where it needs to be embedded in the hypervisor. So multi-tenancy is immediately out of the equation, right? If um, you know, a customer is looking to bring things where they need to actually have true hypervisor visibility or co-administration at the hypervisor. And then we go into what's called multi-tenancy in infrastructure as a service, and that's where it's shared commodity. The um, virtual container of resources is going to be segregated, right? It will be de dedicated directly to the customer. The hardware may or may not be oversubscribed underneath the hood, but in essence, a customer is going to receive a pool of resources in a utility fashion, and then they'll instantiate or migrate those, work, those workloads into those pool resources, much dissimilar from where you know we go out and we acquire physical servers. We have the full capacity of the server. We have the full capacity of the memory, um, right? And so we can provision as we see fit across the plane there, and we can look at the hypervisor. Private cloud is going to be very similar to you know that model. Um, storage might be shared in that fashion where you get the benefits of uh, you know utility storage, but you're getting the dedication of the compute environment. 
and then um, move it into platform as a service. So this is where you know the use case is going to be um, the interesting part about platform as a service is there are different use cases, but we talk about like standing up. We only hand off at the data and the application level. So essentially everything else under the hood is being taken care of for you except for the data and the application model. As we talked about in like network connectivity, right? Um, platform as a service, how you get there, right? It's going to be network connectivity, whether it's going directly over the internet or you have some secure connection to the platform as a service. And then at that point, the service provider is going to hand off only the data and the application to you. Um, so there are some benefits that relate towards, um, you know, DevOps or uh, what we'll call expansion that we'll get into in terms of the benefits. But again, the, the service provider is taking the risk from the runtime down the stack. So all the risk is on the service provider at that point where traditional IT or the business owners are dealing with the data and the application layer. And then we move into full software as a service. Typically this is going to be right um, ground up. Uh, so anything that's net new web developed, new applications, or you're going to shift from a legacy environment maybe into software as a service. So uh, different models have different use cases for them. SAP I think it's S4, HANA, they're coming out with their own hosted, essentially it could be considered almost a, almost a SaaS model, but it's more platform specific. Um, you get into EMR, Epic has their own hosted, which would be platform as a service. But, you know, getting into the true software as a service stack, that's where, you know, they're just handing off essentially the interface, uh, the service providers taking advantage of everything under the hood from the application down. So you'll have API integrations, configurations, but the risk model is, you know, you're, they're on the hook for everything except for, you know, what you do from a configuration standpoint. So does this make sense for everybody? All right, cool. Now, advantages and benefits. So typically when we get into, like we referred to in previous conversations, like total cost of ownership, when people start considering infrastructure as a service models, customers immediately go into, well, there's an economical advantage. That's the biggest equation that you hear in the industry is there's an economical advantage towards moving to as a service model. So when cloud was first coming out, everybody's like, it's going to cost cheaper, it's going to be cheaper. So the biggest push was driving economics. There are economical advantages, um, but there's also disadvantages related to that that could be hidden charges, et cetera, which will get kind of covered in the total cost of ownership, um, uh, this review later on in the, in the sections. But, you know, essentially from a perspective is, you know, we, we have uh, this idea that we're going to get predictable costs with as a service. That is somewhat true and not true, right? Uh, when it comes to infrastructure as a service, you're going to get a container of resources. So the way we bill, it's fixed cost per units. Um, when you get into the hyperscalers like, you know, Azure, Amazon, Google, et cetera, you have um, hidden charges, which would be ingress, egress, or other aesthetics that make up that portfolio of services. Or when you're buying capacity, you may be forced to buy compute, memory, and storage in increments, and you may have to buy access of increments in order to achieve you know, what you're looking for. And so you may end up having surplus in that uh, perspective. So we kind of get into like some of the sizing calculators you know, again, the, the economies of scale drive towards there's going to be an economical benefit, but not all cloud models are the same when it gets to that equation. Yeah, it's, it's actually a good um, segue point, right? So, you know, as Chris mentioned, we've, we've had some different use cases. I'll bring up one, which was ransomware attack, right? We talked about DR as a service. Uh, customer went through a ransomware attack. Um, they were running, you know, in a multi-tenant cloud at US Signal for a period of time and then um, things were stable running for about three months, their board, and it wasn't IT, just randomly made the decision that they were going to go to Azure. Someone on the board had an epiphany for Azure, made the decision without really going and doing a, a cost of ownership. Um, there was an assistance in migrating that customer into Azure, and then you know, after running for a month, there was the big sticker shock about how I go about controlling costs. Uh, so. That's one of those things where, again, you know, without having the formality of, of due diligence or pushing back, right, to look at total cost of ownership and assessments, um, you can get into a really sticky, sticky lane. So they're, they're going back and trying to find ways to mitigate costs. Um, they're in an environment where it's a retail shop with a, with a web presence. And so from a product standpoint, 
It's not like they can schedule, you know, downtime of virtual machines and try to play the game of, you know, the utility costs. Well, if I can shut the machines down because I rent by the hour, right, that I can, I can save costs that way and didn't have the luxury of doing those things. Um, so, you know, try to cut costs in other mitigating ways, but those are things where, like I, you know, I would bring up in, the, in other conversations from an equation standpoint is that sometimes we have compelling events, you know, and as advisors for those compelling events, it's really to kind of take a step back to advise the business on the best course of action, even if someone above is, is trying to push the needle in this direction, it's making sure you do the homework ahead of time versus after the fact trying to go to Microsoft and negotiate some long-term contract to get better cost benefits out of it. And even then, I think they were spending you know, north of 40% uh, you know, additional cost than what their budget was, uh, was affording or allowing. If that best price, they've got to go to a three-year term, and then if it still doesn't get the cost down to where they're at, then they're really stuck. They're well, they're, they're stuck. They, they signed a three-year contract, and they're stuck, but they're trying to find other ways to save some money. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it can be, and that's the other side of it too, right? That's a good point. Is people uh, from a, a, a complexity standpoint or whatnot, they're not aware of it or they've not pursued it, and you know, coming out of a ransomware event, having to even greenfield to some degree some of the environment. Um, long term, it might be something they could look at, but they're they're forced kind of in that paradigm just because they allowed their uh, board to make a bad decision for them and, and ran with it. Uh, so, you know, advantages of infrastructure as a service. So the biggest one is going to be flexibility, right? So we have utility uh, capability with flexibility. Um, so I get the advantage of, you know, versus fixed capacity where I have to budget to go out and acquire fixed capacity. That capacity may has, have overages or surpluses with the flexibility here. I can scale up and scale down on demand um, in what's considered infrastructure as a service. The way we operate at Signal is we're month to month on our utility cloud services. That is the biggest benefit for us is that month to month customers can scale up and scale down with, with no billing impact or contractual impact to the cloud environment. Um, much the same for credit card swipe. If you're not signing a contract with any of the public cloud providers, you've got the ability to scale up and scale down. Again, as I mentioned before, there might be some restrictions in how that looks in terms of resources that you have to acquire, but you'll still get that same flexibility. Um, the other one's going to be high availability. So much like what was caused the, or addressing performance or outages for lack of capacity, right? Um, you're getting high availability down below where in the next bullet point, we're talking about workloads. So underneath the hood, um, as a enterprise customer, I have fixed amount of budget. I can only buy so many servers or resources. I may have N plus one. When it comes to cloud, you know, it should be like N plus, you know, the nth degree. It shouldn't matter if they're hardware failures from the infrastructure level to the core switch level to the storage level all the way through the compute cycles. There's resiliency and redundancy baked into that so that you have a higher uptime. Where we typically see outages, like what normally gets announced, right, could be facility impacts, it could be network impacts for availability to access that cloud environment. Typically, you don't see the cloud environment in itself being impaired or impacted. Um, previous use cases that kind of came out from an awareness perspective, you know, ways back, Amazon had their storage designed very poorly at one point where um, you know, they actually had regional outages at the EC2 instances just because of how they designed their storage platform. You know, they've remediated that since, but those are things where cloud providers learn from, you know, one another in terms of their own development. But we found that sometimes cloud could be risky, but for the most part, you shouldn't see too many outages when it comes to dealing with cloud. And if you do, it really comes down to the availability, not so much the environment itself being unavailable. Then lower latency, um, so what's going to happen there, right, is you're going to have lower latency. For the most part, from an application workload perspective, you have high-speed backplanes that are available. Um, so geography-wise, like here at Signal, we're operating eight data centers. We have our own fiber footprint. Um, other cloud providers are brokeraging their, their 
right? They're fiber in some degrees because not everybody is a, a, is a carrier owner, but they're ensuring that they have enough latency and capacity between those facilities to be able to offer lower latency for workloads. A good example is like from Grand Rapids to Detroit or from Grand Rapids to Chicago or, to, or Detroit to Chicago, um, a customer could come into the cloud environment and really run active active inside the cloud environment because our latency between those facilities on our back call is less than five milliseconds of round trip time. So you're able to do literally synchronous write capabilities for applications geo diverse on that backbone. So you trying to achieve the same thing in your own, you know, premise data centers. And I experienced this at the bank where, you know, I was trying to go more, uh, not active active, but the push was to have zero downtime in a DR situation. In most enterprises are trying to achieve as much as or as close to zero time, downtime or zero loss of data, right, when a DR event hits. How to achieve that is to have synchronous write capability to your offsite facility. So if you're buying your own gear and you're standing up your own environment, that one is very expensive. You have to have two facilities, but you also have to have high bandwidth, low latency, resiliency between those facilities. What ended up happening was you're at the mercy of carrier maintenance events, right, along that route. And then you may not have uh, as built documentation, so maybe they're not truly diverse connectivity, um, or you're predicated to fiber cuts. Where on a carrier backhaul, like you said, when you come into a data center and you have multiple fiber entrances and you have multiple fiber rings, you have a much more resilient, healthy backbone network to rely on, right, for that replication between the facilities where if you're trying to do it yourself, you think of just having two strands of string going between two facilities, and if those are down, you're down. Um, the likelihood of that happening, if it's built correctly, right, is uh, less chance, but you're still dealing with risk, and the risk is doing it yourself in that regard um, is much more expensive when it comes to considering the cost of cloud and geodiverse cloud services from a resiliency perspective. So when people think of design, they don't think of those designs in that way unless you have, maybe you need 100 gig plus capacity of bandwidth with super low latency, so you're used to dark fiber or something. We come across some of the really global enterprises that have those types of use cases, but that's because they built their environment to rely on dark fiber. So it's not so much of a workload problem, it's more of a network reconfiguration retooling problem. To consume cloud services. Uh, improved provisioning. Customers can provision right in a matter of minutes. You're getting essentially in true infrastructure as a service, you're going to get a portal. Um, in the hyperscalers, you should be able to just add capacity on demand. You know, you signal, it takes minutes to add capacity. So you get a pool of resources, they're there and available. You're able to add um, as you see fit or retract as you see fit. So um, improving provisioning is going to be really key. So, you know, back in my day, if I was running into a capacity problem running my own premise data center, I have to go out and acquire additional hardware. I don't have cloud burst capability. I don't have the ability to stand up another server. The wor you know, the worst thing I could do or the most risky thing I could do is maybe take my N plus one configuration and go without it if I needed immediate capacity to where there was some sort of random ramp up uh, to make that available. And as I talked about, um, right, supply chain issues, in some cases, depending upon your equipment manufacturer, you may be running into six month delays um, for the hardware. So we can't always plan in business for capacity increases, ideally. Um, the business doesn't always give you the most um, up to date time frame of when they're going to need it um, from a procurement standpoint. We can budget for it, but again, those are things where, from a risk perspective, if you're a good enterprise, you're planning for supply chain issues, but you can't always estimate truly when your capacity needs may hit. Uh, comprehensive security. So when it comes to compliances, all right, you've heard me talk about compliances. Um, you're going to get an elevated security posturing with infrastructure as a service because the uh, service provider has aligned, as I mentioned, with SOC 2, PCI, HIPAA, it doesn't make the environment completely compliant because you as a customer or your customers consuming this environment, right, have shared responsibility. Their data itself, they're the custodian. So if you talk about infrastructure as a service where the service provider hands off at the hypervisor, 
Well, from the hypervisor below, that's enabled for compliance. It doesn't make the environment compliant, it's enabled for compliance. A customer bringing their workloads on top of that where they're responsible for the operating system, the data movements, right? They're also going to be responsible for the rest of that compliance framework. But the fact that the, it's, the environment's been tuned, right, and controlled and monitored and audited to the point where it's compliant enabled, that's much better than someone having to do it themselves. I can tell you that um, at the bank, I went through three, uh, three audit cycles in, I think maybe I had six weeks of break between different audit cycles. So I had constant staff dealing with audits, providing audit frameworks while trying to get stuff done for the business to um, you know, also do volume scans and trying to do patch management. So you're essentially taking a lot of all of the, what we call operational value off the table because it's just keeping the lights on work. To keep the lights on work goes away, IT focuses on the business. So that's really the comprehensive security piece of it is it removes that away from being in-house ownership to that shared risk model. And then faster access to best of breed technology. So there's concerns Right, typically when you capitally buy, like uh, at the bank, we want to run things for a five-year depreciation schedule. That made the most sense for running things off the books because the cost of the business was as low as possible. Sometimes they would accept a three-year depreciation model. When it comes to cloud services, right, you're not predicated to having to deal with, well, the server is 10 years old or eight years old. Chris, how many times you run into that where we have environments where they haven't they haven't upgraded, they're still running stuff that's so legacy, it's end of life. Um, it happens. So best of breed technology is widely available uh, from a cloud service provider. We're constantly adding new compute clusters. We're constantly upgrading the hardware. I mean, since I've been here, I think the storage arrays have changed hands at least five different times from a model perspective, from a growth perspective. So you're getting access to best of breed technology. Um, on top of that, right, we were the... Um, one of the first in the nation to go 100 gig with Cisco. So yeah, we were the first ones, 100 gig backbone. So what does that mean, 100 gig backbone? Well, we're gonna be going to 400 gig backbone. Um, core networking, right? Core networking is gonna get upgraded, increased. So we're constantly adding to the portfolio that best of breed technology to where as a customer, and I can remember from a networking perspective, running very aged gear, um, it just happens. So those are things where I said you, you don't have to take care of uh, those things. A lot of those things get taken care of for you. But one of the, um, you know, the, the easiest questions, like if you're talking to an enterprise cloud provider, is looking at their hardware refresh cycle, looking at what's available to customers, how are they measuring performance, right? How are they staying compliant? Uh, those would be advisement pieces, right, to look at and to go through the use cases. Yep, it is. Yeah, I mean, the networking kind of goes the same way. Um, so there's flexibility in networking where, you know, no matter who you're hosting with for cloud, you could bring your own networking with you or you're consuming service provider, right, provided networking. So like in that case, if it's firewall, it could be Palo Alto virtualized from signal or bring in your own virtual instance. But that's something where customers need to think about like availability. So if you talk about seasonal, we have some customers, whether they have their own virtual firewall or they consume ours, Right, they can scale their actually their internet bandwidth up and down, which you know, in the case of like a premise-based customer, it's contractually binding if they scale their bandwidth up. Um, you know, I ran a large contract with AT and T, and I didn't have the availability to just auto grow my internet bandwidth or um, the bandwidth for replicating between my facilities or my data centers. So that's like I said, some of the hidden benefits for like cloud consumption is going to be those other aesthetics, right, for being able to do things. The virtual firewall might need to be relicensed or scaled up. Those are things that we offer month to month where you bring your own, maybe your virtual firewall is going to be limited. But again, those are those are different options that are available. Provisioning wise too, so you know, YesSignal is a VMware uh, cloud provider, so it's vCloud Director. So any integrations from an API perspective for provisioning for vCloud Director, customers can integrate with for provisioning perspectives, right? So you get whether it's automation or other controls available to them to consume that. All right, then platform as a service. So the, the first thing with platform as a service, like right, we talked about data and applications available to the customer. So immediately, you know, there's no need to go and purchase and install anything. 
Um, there's no licensing that's, that's needed to be purchased for the application. So essentially, you just need to have the data, and then you have the application. So from a developer standpoint, they don't have to wait for IT to stand anything up. They can immediately start instantiating instances of the application. They could potentially have uh, different versions of that, that application. So dev teams really improve time for being able to take a project from conceptual stage to moving it towards you know, making a decision. Whether they're using platform as a service as just a dev tool, maybe they own the licensing on hand and they can, they can actually have the version out in the platform as a service, stand that up quicker. I mean, there's, there's different kind of use cases for platforms as a service, but uh, DevOps is usually typically the best benefit for it for you know, um, getting time to market for waiting on them. And then also from the business being able to realize the application being up and running much quicker. Uh, affordable wider variety of resources. So that is essentially, you know, choices up and down. So operating systems, middleware, databases, and dev tools. So those are all pieces, right, that an organization has to have and stand up themselves. Those are all baked into the platform, or they're supposed to be. Um, you know, you can, you don't have to have additional dedicated infrastructure or dedicated infrastructure for DevOps or for testing grounds, right? Platform as a service, the service provider is providing all the resource materials under the hood. Obviously, there's going to be a cost associated with some of this, but you could do multi-instancing. You could do different versions of instancing off that multi-instance. So it gives basically a lot of flexibility to do, uh, to do a testing ground and have that baked in. Then cost-effective scalability, like I, I was referring to, the platform as a service, essentially all the resources are baked into that. So you know, from a use case perspective, again, we don't have to go out and acquire anything. We don't have to go and stand anything up. We can basically just instantiate the instance as long as we got the data. Or we can migrate the data from you know, a production instance to a test dev instance uh, without you know, complication. Then flexibility for dev teams, uh, you know, it's kind of a repeat, but essentially, right, you just need network connectivity from an access standpoint. The platform is going to be there to do the work. Um, when it comes to legacy, though, moving towards a platform as a service, you know, sounds easy. It's not as easy, right, <laughs> to take an application from, you know, legacy stack to move it into platform as a service. We're talking about, you know, still digital transformation. So even though the platform as a service is easily available, getting your data from a legacy app that can migrate directly into platform as a service is a lot harder than what it looks like. This is great for greenfielding, for standing things up, but when it comes to actual execution, you know, I, I, I've got customers that are replatforming. Some of them are multi-years, right, replatforming, just because the way they've developed the application, the way they've developed the integration, the customizations that go along with it, a uh, good example was I was running a subsidiary and we were doing uh, Oracle Financial Services. So we stood up uh, Oracle Financial Services, spent about a million dollars in customizations uh, on top of that for billing system integrations, you know, um, inventory, uh, tracking of, of uh, warranties. It was an auto warranty premium business. And so when you think about like all the decoupling of the modulars that were put together for an application, that doesn't easily transcend in the platform or software as a service. So while there's great benefits here, there's also great risk for uh, folks that are non uh, right IT or developers to think about those risk items about all the investment that was put into a what well, really is a customized package for your business to try to transcend that directly into platform as a service. So it could take a long time to migrate something legacy wise. So Folks really have to do a good job of documentation to really understand all the application integrations, uh, understand the dynamics of how the businesses are consuming those integrations. And then obviously those aren't going to be there by default. There's API hooking capabilities, but understand what is the cost of those customizations to, to move those and recreate those. That's where I see the time suck. All this sounds great, but there's a lot of time investment when it comes to dealing with the other things that are those unhidden or excuse me the hidden variables and then software as a service so software as a service right it's going to be different from the traditional model um, as we talked about in the shared risk it's just handing off the software interface you got your apis you got your customization panels 
and you're able to go gangbusters from there as a business organization. So software as a service still, though, is one of those things where migration of data into software as a service, if it's going to be getting migrated, is, is a complexity that's not being addressed. But the time to benefit is if you're going to greenfield, you're going to have immediate availability because the application's already available. So when we think about like a business or a startup business or someone that's moving away from a legacy platform to something new, I can immediately start doing uh, testing operations and user validations uh, by doing a little bit of uh, configuration. Cost savings. So it's shared multi-tenancy, just like everything else, except for the service providers taking care of everything under the hood, including the software licensing. So it's going to be really able to scale. The biggest benefits, obviously, are small to mid-sized businesses where there's not a lot of complexity in the application stacks. Where you get into larger enterprises, like I talked about before, could be a lot of integration pieces that need to be considered. But when it comes to the app itself, it's there, it's widely available and widely usable. Uh, scalability and integration. Um, so that's much like cloud, right? You can scale up and down based on need or use cases. Uh, typically with SaaS platforms, there might be a cost per seed or a cost per user for access, or there could be some other baked in charges for resources. They all bill a little bit differently, but for the most part, you're going to get immediate scale and integration from that standpoint because the service providers owning all the capacity, the growth and all the, all the planning underneath the hood. Um, some of the risk items there, uh, I would say, is networking. So in network connectivity, right, we talked about NNIs, um, and I talked about Equinix, right, in SaaS platforms. So if a customer came to you as Signal, maybe they're in our co-location, maybe they're a network customer, maybe they're a brand new customer, and they want to consume an a act, active SaaS platform and say, I want private connectivity to that SaaS platform, we'll use Salesforce as an example. Right, so going through uh, the cloud exchange to broker that connectivity, right? The cloud exchange may have an NNI or the SaaS platform itself, right? Where they're hosting it, even they may be hosting it regionally, geo diverse, right? They still have to pay for networking and they still have to pay for network brokerage. And we have seen problems where customers lose access to their SaaS platform, and they come to the network provider and go, "Hey, I lost access. What happened?" Right? Well. It was an NNI issue at Equinix, right? Couldn't, couldn't do anything about that. So sometimes there's problems at the cloud exchange. Sometimes there's problems where the SaaS platform is actually being hosted from a network resiliency perspective. So that's the other hidden sort of risk item to take advantage of when it looks like, hey, scalability or integration, uh, ease of use consumption, but IT sort of loses control of the connectivity piece when we move out to SaaS platforms or, or the PaaS platforms because they're hosting elsewhere where maybe the provider doesn't have direct control over the network, and we as a consumer don't understand all the NNIs that you have to go through to get there.